the streaming service, but it also helps fund curriculum for the classrooms for teachers. It helps us cover the state with their news department and bureaus throughout the state. It helps us produce locally produced documentaries about the culture and history of West Virginia. What Passport does is it puts the power in the viewer's hands. You're watching West Virginia Public Broadcasting. Tuesday on the West Virginia Channel. From West Virginia Public Broadcasting. You want a specific reason why I don't want to go into in politics? You have one, fine, if not. Any others? I think there are other endeavors that, that suit my talents a little better. The 24th governor of West Virginia, William Casey Martin. Most former governors have managed to work their way into private business in an executive capacity. Marlin worked his way into a job as a taxi driver in Chicago. Governor, you sound like you didn't like politics in the first place. Is that right? I, would, I wouldn't use such strong languages. I didn't like politics. Uh, no, I enjoyed it very much. But that too has passed. Marlin's administration in the mid-50s was marked by the usual number of ups and downs arguments with the press, political differences. Bill Marlin was not a good politician. He was more the big idea CEO type. Here's the plan, you make it work. I've done all the hard work for you. Well, that doesn't work in politics. At age 34, William Casey Marlin entered the governor's office, the youngest chief executive in West Virginia's 90-year history. A half century later, Marland is ranked among the state's most brilliant minds and visionary governors. He felt that when you went and became a servant of the people, that that's really what you were supposed to be doing. You're supposed to be doing things that would make their lives better. Governor William C. Marlin, nonetheless, is often remembered as a failed politician, a stubborn maverick who couldn't take the political heat, an alcoholic who wound up a cabbie on the cold streets of Chicago. A more complete image emerges through recently discovered news film, home movies, and other archival recordings. Enhanced by recent personal accounts, the truth and inspiration of one man's story gains new perspective, a story of success, failure, redemption, and validation. The story of Governor William Casey Marland. He was a fairly heroic figure in spite of all his difficulty and fighting and flaws and failure. He's sort of one of my heroes. This forward-looking university offers courses patterned to keep pace with West Virginia's progress, such as oil and gas engineering, mining, agriculture, law, and medicine. Bill Marlin's future in politics began taking shape in the 1940s. As a law student at West Virginia University, Marlin astounded faculty and classmates alike with his quick mind and photographic memory. General Charles Fox oversaw the State National Guard during Marlin's four years as governor. In May 2000, Fox recalled two officers who had roomed with Marlin in college. They said he'll sit there with a beer, half asleep. If we ask him a question about a lecture, he can quote it just like it had been recorded. His mind was absolutely perfect. After graduating at the top of his class in 1947, Marlin received an appointment as clerk for Southern West Virginia's U.S. District Court. Federal Judge Ben Moore, impressed with his new law clerk, later wrote that Marlin possessed the finest mind in West Virginia. With Homer Hanna, an influential member of the state Democratic Party, serving as Moore's head clerk, Marlin rose from clerk to Attorney General of West Virginia in less than two years. Then, in 1952, the Democratic Party faced charges of statehouse corruption. On behalf of the people of West Virginia. To continue the party's 20-year reign in the governor's office, begun when Republican William Conley was succeeded by Herman Kump in 1933, 
the Democrats required a respectable gubernatorial candidate with a clean slate. Amid a field of prominent old school candidates, youthful Attorney General William C. Marlin seemed ideal. Former governor and sitting U.S. Senator Matthew Neely joined current Governor Oki Patterson in ardently supporting candidate Marlin. After claiming his party's nomination, Bill Marlin defeated Republican challenger Rush Holt, formerly a U.S. Senator and member of the Democratic Party. The State House machine thought, we'll let him be governor, but we'll call the shots. And they didn't know Bill Marlin. So it was that the 24th Chief Executive of West Virginia took the reins. And the new governor, in his inaugural address, outlined his program. First, economy, which Governor Marlin analyzed as living tissue under surgical operation to remove the useless, to maintain the vital. He said the biggest problem in West Virginia is the highway system, which calls for increased spending. Governor Marlin feels that counties should assume more of the burden for school finance. And apparently, he'll have recommendations on the subject when he speaks to the legislator later this week. Three days later, the legislature convened, and that's when he uh, opened up the box and said he wanted to uh, impose a severance tax on natural resources. It caused an explosion of protest because the coal companies had enormous power in those days, and Marlin was just attacked and beaten over the head so much that he was almost destroyed. As a gunnery officer and landing ship commander in the Second World War, Bill Marland had made critical life and death decisions. As governor, Marland determined that if West Virginia were to move forward, it was his duty to make some unpopular changes. I must say, for the record, that it is disturbing to see the signposts pointing toward the vacillation that is inherent in discussions of reorganization, meritization, and so forth without a discussion of corollary measures, namely how to provide adequate resources to meet the problems of public finance, without which no type of organization can grapple with the basic problems of West Virginia. When Marlin took office, there were about 111,000 coal miners. By the time he left office, it was down to 55,000. So you had this dramatic drop in employment, the increased mechanization, the nation's in a recession, there's competing energy sources. The severance tax just was not a good timing on his part. And he wouldn't compromise. Ladies and gentlemen of West Virginia, Ohio, Kentucky, Virginia. Considered a novice lacking political clout of his own, Marlin had claimed the governor's office carrying only 24 of West Virginia's 55 counties. Had he won by a considerable margin, and made peace with opposing factions within his own party, the new governor may have been in a better position to make demands. There's been too little effort in the past several years to do anything about reducing the costs of state government. House Minority Leader during Bill Marlin's tenure as Chief Executive, Governor Cecil Underwood recalled in 1998 Marlin's effort to establish a severance tax in 1953. He was a very combative person. He liked to uh, uh, disagree and to argue points and I think uh, had he not set it up as a surprise had he done his groundwork and consulted with the legislature with the leadership of both sides he might have succeeded in getting it through. Marlin later conceded he should have worked to build a support base and muster forces to enact the severance tax. Here's Marlin in 1965. I know that every one of us in this room can think back to where his own impatience led him blindly toward something or he missed something good to get where he thought was the place to go. He was so bright and he had this, you know, this vision and he just knew he was right and everybody else was wrong. When he'd think something through and come to what he thought was the right answer for someone in his position, he would just assume in the beginning that everyone else would come to that answer who was of goodwill because after all, that was the right answer. He was so bright, he had very little patience with anybody who couldn't understand where he was trying to go with his thoughts. 
I have often thought that the development of the natural resources of any state, community, city, county, would be measured only by the ingenuity, the energy, and enthusiasm of the human resources of that particular area. No one ever questioned his brilliancy and, and uh, his understanding of the state, his dedication to the state. Uh, it was the abruptness with which he made decisions. Lawmakers denounced the Marlin proposal from the start. Many in the Democratic-controlled legislature saw it and other of the young governor's measures as throwbacks to the Republican Party. Great achievement brings increased responsibility. Labor leader John L. Lewis, among others, endorsed the tax on natural resources. The Charleston Gazette, in support of the coal industry at the time, forecast the demise of the severance tax while attacking Lewis and Governor Marlin. Bill Marlin, a proud card-carrying member of the United Mine Workers of America, enjoyed the support of the UMWA. This threatened the influence of the Democratic Party leaders over tens of thousands of West Virginia's coal miners. Despite strong opposition, Marlin persisted through much of the 1953 legislative session. The chief executive's actions would define his administration's relationship with the legislature, the press, and the public. He saw a lot of things that needed to be done in West Virginia. Uh, there was a lot of money going out, and there was not really much being used to help the state. And he just thought that was wrong. William Casey Marlin grew up in the coal fields of Illinois and West Virginia. He was born in 1918 at Johnston City in South Central Illinois. Well, it's just home to me, and it's home to a lot of people. The region is home as well to the first coal deposits found in North America. Johnny Dodd spent 34 years in one of the many coal mines once claiming much of the landscape here. There was at least 10 coal mines right in here within a mile and a half. They were so close to running into each other underground. They closed them all up now and said the coal wasn't no good. When mining started to ebb in that area, a lot of the people from Illinois moved to Wyoming Raleigh County. Joseph Wesley Marland and his wife Maud were among those moving from Illinois to the southern West Virginia coal fields. In 1925, the Marlin family settled in the Wyoming County community of Glen Rogers. Glen Rogers was quite a melting pot. We had people from all over the world. It wasn't just a little place up the hollow, it was quite an interesting place. It had a big company store, had a hotel, movie theater, uh, all the trappings of a little town and had 1,000 men on the payroll at one time. They mined coal three shifts a day in the second largest mine in the state. But it was one of the most dangerous mines in the world. You know, 120 some guys killed there. After turning 14, Bill Marlin spent summers working at the Glen Rogers Mine, run at the time by his father, J.W. To support the local high school where his son played quarterback and graduated as valedictorian, J.W. Marlin excised portions of miners' salaries. He also insisted employees participate in local elections. They had astronomical turnouts because Mr. Marlin would go see that they voted and stand and check their name off as they went in the, to the voting place. Grace Marlin Beck in 2005 described her father as a benevolent dictator. He wanted things done the way he wanted them done and he expected us to do. Singing around the family piano, however, brought out J.W.'s soft side. When he and his future wife, Maud Casey, first met, she was a talented soprano at the St. Louis Conservatory for Music. She played the piano and they'd sing at home at night. And of course, we loved that. We'd gather in the living room and have, a, have our own musicale. <laughs> Tragedy struck when Maud, 36 years old, succumbed to cancer. After her death, J.W. instructed Bill to set aside his pre-law studies at the University of Alabama. 
J.W. put Bill to work for the next year loading coal in Glen Rogers. Even with a scholarship, it was very expensive. And he thought it would be nice if Bill would learn where this money's coming from. Bill Marlin put his back into his job and reportedly set a record hand loading the most coal in a single day. He also spent time between shifts commiserating with his bereaved father. Some people think that the governor's drinking problems were sparked by his mother's death. In the wake of Maud's passing, Bill and his father shared more than the occasional drink. J.W. reportedly kept a bottle in his car and adhered to the notion real men drank doubles. Where you have extractive industries, where people work very hard all day, and in, oftentimes in dangerous situations, and oftentimes in isolated areas, there's not many other kinds of social activities, and people will party and have drinks. Born the same year the Glen Rogers coal mine began operating, 1918, Bill Marlin saw production ebb just as his political career began to flourish in the 1950s. Living and working in the southern coal fields, Marlin had seen for himself how coal mining increasingly drained West Virginia of its natural resources, with little in return for its people. He saw that out-of-state coal companies used West Virginia like a colony and they, they bled out all the coal wealth, and they didn't pay anything, really. They paid little pittance of property taxes. As governor, Marlin saw attacks on coal, gas, oil, and timber as a way to fuel a better future to improve West Virginia's roads and schools. All of us will agree that our public school system is a keystone in our political, cultural, and economic life. If this is so, should we not contemplate broad revenue sources based upon the ability of our citizens to pay? Shortly after Governor Marlin first proposed a severance tax on natural resources in 1953, three U.S. congressmen, including freshman Robert C. Byrd, spoke in favor of such a tax before a joint legislative committee. State UMW leaders advocated equalized property assessments, while coal industry officials strongly opposed taxation. After Marlin failed to mobilize constituents and lawmakers to actively support the proposed severance tax, the Senate Finance Committee tabled further consideration during the 1953 legislative session. While recommending tax increases in 1955, Governor Marlin suggested that the legislature's failure to enact a severance tax had contributed to further budgetary shortfalls. My only aim is to help you find some way out of this difficulty in which your decision of some two years ago led you. I don't think he had any illusions about how difficult it would be. But every movement of that sort, everything like that, has to begin somewhere. Well, Mr. Speaker, what is the House leadership reaction to this sales tax? The leadership of the House is unalterably opposed to this measure because we believe that it places the burden of financing our government on the people who are least able to pay. In the years to come, West Virginia lawmakers would continue to grapple with the issue of inadequate taxation. Uh, frankly, I'm speaking for myself now. I feel that we're going to have to find some new revenue. I hope that we can find it uh, within the present tax structure. Lawmakers eventually expanded the state tax structure and in 1987 enacted a severance tax, 30 years after Governor Marlin left office. As chief executive, however, Marlin did enjoy some measure of success and popularity. The expansion of industry in the coming year will exceed even that of the past year or any previous year. Bolstered by a report praising the state's labor climate, Governor Marlin determined to reduce the state's dependency upon coal by wooing new industry to West Virginia. I will present the cold industrial facts of West Virginia to potential industrial prospects wherever we can find them, and at the same time, assure them of our friendly interest in them as future industrial citizens of our state. Touting himself as West Virginia's number one salesman, Governor Marlin traveled some 50,000 miles to New York and 21 other cities in 17 states. He spoke to dozens of chambers of commerce and other groups, had luncheons for them, wined them and dined them. And he was very articulate 
And he just knew if he could get enough people to listen, they would say, gee, why haven't we gone to West Virginia before now? You know, let's go. And he was successful. Governor Marlin's efforts were bolstered in 1954 when Kaiser Aluminum and Chemical Corporation of California announced plans to locate a $300 million plant in Jackson County. Marlin relished the success of the state's industrial development program. It will furnish the ways and means to strengthen our programs in roads, schools, health and welfare, and even more, it will provide jobs. It will provide jobs for a growing population. As West Virginia welcomed thousands of new jobs, Governor Marland worked to attract additional revenue sources by promoting West Virginia as a tourist destination. He thought that West Virginia could become a tourist mecca. Marlin traveled to Colorado and Canada where he saw how a good transportation system could bring thousands of tourists to somewhere like tranquil, unspoiled West Virginia. He says, look, we need to expand our state parks, build some roads so people can come and go, get in and out of here. And he said, we'll attract all kinds of people from D.C., Baltimore, Philadelphia to come to the mountains, come to the fresh air in West Virginia. The Marlins, for their part, rented a cabin each summer in Watoga State Park in Pocahontas County. During Bill Marlin's four-year term as governor, four new parks were added to the 15 that were open when he took office. Together, the chief executive and state legislature worked to expand existing parks and recreational facilities throughout West Virginia. Integration of white and Negro pupils in West Virginia has progressed more rapidly than was anticipated. West Virginia received national praise in 1954 when Governor Marlin, amid strong objection by constituents, issued an executive order in accordance with the U.S. Supreme Court's decision declaring segregation of public schools unconstitutional. Immediately, we took the position that the Supreme Court's ruling was the law of the land, and as, that as such, we should obey it in both spirit and word. Such victories, however, failed to overshadow the ongoing public battle between the legislative and executive branches of government. Despite improvements in state administrative practices, the manner in which Governor Marlin wielded his executive powers and influence frequently frustrated legislative leaders. In 1955, Governor Marlin called upon lawmakers to respond to public cries for increased teacher salaries and improvement of the state's educational system. In discussions with your legislative leaders, the thought was expressed that they were unable to actually ascertain the sentiment of this body concerning this matter and I therefore felt that it was in the public interest to have this matter placed before you for discussion. When lawmakers failed to act decisively regarding teacher salary increases, Governor Marlin went fishing in Florida, leaving the issue squarely in the hands of the legislature. Despite such controversy, Marlin welcomed candid discussions with reporters and became West Virginia's first chief executive to regularly hold press conferences. On behalf of the people of West Virginia, I want to join. Marland, however, seemed ill-prepared for the invasive nature of television news. WCHS-TV cinematographer Bill Kelly found himself equally unprepared when Marland asked him to leave a meeting with a visiting dignitary. I had to get several shots to make a story out of it for television. And he turned around to me and he says, have you got all everything you need? He says, how about getting done and get out of here? You never knew how he was going to be. One day he'd be nice as he could be, and the next day he'd be very cross. And that may have been because of his alcohol problem. Governor Marlin also drew public ire and cries of nepotism when he appointed his brother Bob state purchasing director and awarded his father, J.W., a liquor contract worth as much as $25,000 a year. Bill Kelly remembers how attendance at Charleston's annual North-South football game failed to show Governor Marlin the respect afforded previous chief executives. He wasn't very popular with the, with the citizens. All the governors always came to the North-South games. and It's the first time I'd ever heard anybody booed like Marlin was booed at the North-South game. And the stands just erupted in loud boos. It is my thought that if we can work together and prevent... Bill Marlin found sanctuary a door over from the Capitol when he walked home to the governor's mansion for lunch. There, 
fighting was mostly kids' play. If I would go out to meet him, there was always a huge smile on his face, and he was always happy to see me, and I, I never saw the tension that I'm sure that he was going through. Susan Marlin Giambroni says she and her brothers enjoyed being with their dad. He was fun, delightful in many ways, just very personable. I had no problems ever talking to him. There was never a stigma or anything around him, oh, dad's coming. That never, ever happened. All of us thought it was great when he was around, which was quite often. In his children, Governor Marlin observed an innocence foreign to West Virginia politics. We had a trampoline, and that was exciting, and the third floor was empty, so we got to roller skate up there, and they had these wonderful, fantastic parties, and I was the fairy princess. John Marlin found definite advantages to living in the governor's mansion. His father's position made for a particularly nice Christmas one year. While visiting Santa at Charleston's Diamond Department Store, John told the man in the red suit what he wanted. John saw no need to inform his mother. And finally, on Christmas Eve, um, she was putting me to bed, and uh, I think what I said was, uh, it's going to be really great to have that fire engine in the morning. And Mother, of course, panicked at that point because she hadn't bought a fire truck. She didn't know anything about a fire truck. So she went in and said, Bill, ran in and said, Bill, he, need, he wanted a fire engine. They called up the manager of the Diamond, who opened up at midnight on Christmas Eve, and they went down and bought a fire engine and brought it back for me. Lawrence Beck said in 2005 that his brother-in-law, Bill Marlin, was a determined individual. He got his fire truck, but he went through the whole thing without, you know, saying, oh, we'll get it tomorrow. No, he's going to have a fire truck if I can find somebody to let me in the store. He's laughing, he said, well, I thought one time about breaking and entering. Among the many visitors to grace the governor's mansion, one particular guest caught the attention of young Susan Marlin. She had the bedroom right next to mine, and my mother had warned me not to bother the nice lady. And of course, being a child and curiosity, I had to go say hello. I'm very happy to be in West Virginia again. It was years later that I figured out who it was that I had been having this wonderful conversation with. That was Eleanor Roosevelt. She was one of the few people that my father truly revered, uh, she and Harry Truman. The impact the former president and first lady had upon Valerie and Bill Marlin impressed their youngest son, Casey. They're Roosevelt Democrats. You know, you just take care of people. You make things right, you know. You don't ignore it because it's an advantage to you to ignore it. For their part, the Marlins sponsored a family immigrating to America. Bill and Valerie helped the couple secure work and a place to live. Bill Marlin first met Valerie Allen while visiting family in Lakin, Illinois. After sharing a dance, the two found they had much in common. They married in 1942. He and my mother would talk interminably about every subject you could possibly think of. And I think that's really what got them together. They were both interested in what the other one had to say. Besides chatting and dancing to the music of the swing era, Bill and Valerie Marland enjoyed opera, Shakespeare, and fishing. On their Dutch Ridge farm, some 20 miles from the state capital, the Marland family raised hens, hogs, and sold apples. People would drive up and buy the bushels of apples and mention things like, uh, you look just like the governor to my father and uh, he used to get a kick out of that. He'd say, yeah, a lot of people tell me that. Because no one, of course, would have believed that the governor of the state of West Virginia was on the side of the road selling apples with his kids. Decades later, Butch Angle purchased the Dutch Ridge property and came to share Bill Marlin's appreciation for it. He said that this was his spiritual home, and I believe it's just because of the beautiful view of the mountains and the peace and the quiet out here. You don't hear anything except maybe a plane every once in a while go over, and uh, it's just very tranquil to sit here and hear nothing. Governor Marlin seemed as content in the sky as he was in his apple orchard. It was pretty common knowledge that Edsel France, the state pilot, taught him to fly. And, and quite often, once they get in the air, Marlin would say, let me have the controls. He soloed the plane. There was uh, 
talk while he was governor. They didn't want him flying because of the attendant uh, danger of flying in West Virginia. In the air, Edsel France's instructions sometimes took a back seat to Bill Marlin's photographic memory. He said, well, now Bill, you need to study up on this, and here's a book on, on this from the FAA and whatever. And, and he just kind of thumbed through it, and then he'd probably say, okay, I'm ready to take over the controls. Casey Marlin, a pilot himself, came to believe that the straightforward thinking required to fly an aircraft helped his father cope with the stress of governing. There's a stress, but it's a very different kind of stress. If you know the rules and you know how to utilize them, you, you just end up you know, doing a good job and you can pat yourself. It's not the murky world of human interaction and politics. Well, I well remember that we have had differences of opinion on solutions to our problems. I am also firmly convinced that it is in the discussions, debates, and arguments over these differences that the sinews of democracy are strengthened and the solutions to our problems eventually brought forth in a democratic manner. I think during his term in office there was times that he really, really enjoyed politics. There was times when he may have wished that he was in a different position. People came to him sometimes with propositions that he thought were not quite right. And his response to that was very simple. He, he couldn't sit and listen to them because it made him so angry. Bill Marlin's family observed the increasing toll upon the governor as he grappled with the legislature. He was knocked down just about every time he opened his mouth. And that was difficult, very, very difficult. During this discussion, the days of this legislative session have been passing. Further delay is not in the best interest of our citizens. Observing Governor Marlin at press conferences and public functions, reporters began to suspect the chief executive had taken to drinking heavily on the job. The first time I was up there, he was pretty sloppy. He had his feet on the desk and, uh, you know, his tie was pulled down and he drank coffee like crazy. There was a little restroom off the side of the uh, governor's office. He'd go in there for his coffee cup and still talk to him and then come back out, and he never really knew what was going on with the coffee. It's true. I mean, the man had a drinking problem, and there were times that he, he was obviously drunk in functions and whatever, but there were just as many times where he was not. But the press or his opponents, you know, portrayed him that way. In an effort to minimize the chief executive's effectiveness, rivals of Marlin allegedly made liquor available to the governor whenever possible. Lute says Valerie Marlin told him in 1975 the governor feared succumbing to alcoholism. She said, I remember very distinctly what I said. I, I just said, oh, Bill, uh, we're too intelligent to ever let a thing like that happen. And then she kind of rolled her eyes and she said, so much for intelligence. Here's Marlin in 1965. This business of sociable drinking is for the birds. There are some people that say that that leads into alcoholism. I don't believe it myself. I think if you're drunk, you're drunk. First time you take a drink, that's it. General Charles Fox, in 2005, recalled an air guard flight he took with Marland from Charleston to Harper's Ferry, some 200 miles away. When he got there, poor old Marland couldn't even stand. He was drunk as a hoot owl. Just that distance. Because when he got a drink, it was all the way down. You can give him a bottle of scotch and it's glug, 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 gone. There was rumor upon rumor upon rumor about his uh, drinking habits. Enough, I never saw Governor Marlin ever consume an alcoholic beverage in the office. What may have gone on in the evening is a different thing. Myself and my wife were invited to the mansion several times. Governor Marlin and his wife visited in my home. I didn't see anything out of the ordinary. Stories of Marlin's drunken behavior, however, became commonplace. Paul Lute says Valerie Marlin vividly recalled the governor storming out of West Virginia's Greenbrier Resort when asked repeatedly to keep the noise down and then to retire for the evening. 
he got mad and called the state troopers down the hall and told them to bring the limousine around. And they got a couple of friends and a couple of bottles, and she said they went out and piled in the state limo and drove back to Charleston that night. Despite the spread of such accounts, Governor William Casey Marland entered his last year as chief executive with great anticipation. I am confident that 1956 will bring positive results from our endeavors of 1955, and our work in the new year will exceed cumulative efforts of the past several years in the competitive field of economic and industrial development. May I take this opportunity to wish all of our citizens a very happy New Year. 1956 for Marland and his fellow West Virginians soon took an unexpected turn. Full knowledge and information of what is going on is vitally essential. U.S. Senator Harley Kilgore of Raleigh County died in February. Marland, ineligible by law to serve a second consecutive term as governor, elected to run for Kilgore's empty seat. Touting the state's recent success with industrial development, Marlin won the Democratic nomination with some 13,000 votes. In the general election, the governor faced Kanawha County Republican and former U.S. Senator Chapman Rivercombe. For a time early in this campaign, my opponent appeared to be claiming credit for having brought new industries into the state. Now, however, with commendable frankness, he publicly disclaims credit for the industries that have come to us. But surely there has been nothing in the State House record to justify any support or continuance in office of those who have administered it. Republican Governor Goodwin Knight of California, a month before the general election, campaigned on behalf of his party in West Virginia. Knight asked whether those in the audience respected the courage, integrity, and sobriety of their chief executive, Governor Marland, as much as they respected the chief executive of the United States, President and World War II General Dwight Eisenhower. Former Commander-in-Chief Harry Truman vigorously campaigned in West Virginia on behalf of Marland and other Democratic candidates. Now there are more than five times as many bankrupts in the bankruptcy courts of this United States than there were in 1952. They like to put that in his pipe and smoke it. Come November, however, West Virginians helped President Eisenhower remain in the White House for four more years. Republicans also claimed the governor's office and the seat of U.S. Senator Harley Kilgore. Even though Eleanor Roosevelt came in and campaigned for the ticket that year for Mollahan for governor and uh, Marlin for Senate, they both went down in defeat. And uh, in those days, uh, Roosevelt name was uh, sacred in this state. At the risk of being trite, I say to the people of West Virginia, it has been a great honor to have had the opportunity to administer your affairs of government over these next last four years. It has been both fascinating and educational, and an experience that will be the highlight of my life. In January 1957, the day after Governor Cecil Underwood's inauguration, Bill Marland and former administrative assistant Arden Curry opened a law firm together. Marland promoted himself as an industrial development counselor. Both of us had really counted on the fact that he had been governor of the state of West Virginia, that for that reason alone there would be a lot of clients come to us for a service. Well, that really wasn't true. There were some. Coal-related businesses seemed to shun Marland. He was pretty much excluded from the big retainer money, uh, particularly with the coal industry. I can't remember one coal operator that sought our services. After serious consideration, it is my decision to seek the so-called short term or unexpired term previously occupied by my good friend M.M. M. Neely. Following the death of U.S. Senator and former Democratic Governor Matthew Mansfield Neely in January of 1958, Marland again ran for the U.S. Senate. And he really campaigned hard for that seat. He had a lot of obstacles in his way. It looked hard, but he worked hard. In this year of 1958, 
our people are faced again with the problems created by the party of the privileged few. Marlin carried a lot of baggage with him, baggage from the state house machine, supposed fraud and corruption in the state road commission, and Jennings Randolph had a lot more financial resources. Former U.S. Congressman Jennings Randolph, a native of Harrison County, enjoyed the support of Senate President Ralph Bean and others opposing former Governor Marland. Hewlett Smith, state Democratic Executive Committee Chair from 1956 to 1961, recalled in 2004 the campaign to defeat Marland in 1958. The opposition didn't have anything to do with him because he was pro-labor and the, the big companies were after him and they spent the money to get him. Bill Marlin lost the Democratic nomination for U.S. Senator and returned his focus to his dwindling law practice. His son John, meanwhile, wanted to know why his father wasn't making more money. And he said, well, the people who are, who are in public service who become rich, many of them uh, got that way by doing things they really shouldn't have. And, uh, and I said, well, why didn't you do that? Because I was more interested in, in toys than anything else. He said, well, I, I didn't because every morning I have to get up and look at myself in the mirror. And that was all he'd say about it. While his family stayed in West Virginia to finish the school year, Bill Marlin sought work out of state. If you can't practice your craft, what are you supposed to do? I'm sure that had a certain you know, amount of, of impact as far as his drinking. Sure, it was depressing. His wife had to start teaching at Charleston High School to support the family. In 1959, former West Virginia Governor William C. Marlin became Northern Sales Director for West Kentucky Coal, a labor-friendly company with offices in Chicago. And his job was to entertain all the coal people. Worst thing he could have been doing with the drinking problem. John Marlin says that the company, despite a hardworking staff, failed to turn a profit. This, he believes, fed his father's addiction to alcohol. He and other good people were doing the very best they could and working as hard as they could, harder than they should maybe even, and they were failing in his mind. During the intervening months before his family would be able to join him in Illinois, Marlin's drinking became what he later called a 24-hour-a-day proposition. He knew he was in trouble when, upon waking up, he would kind of roll out, put his feet on the floor, and on the nightstand, he would pour himself a water glass full of vodka and drink it down. After sporadic attempts to stay sober, Marlin lost his job. He then put himself through every rehab program in the Chicago area. The former governor later told members of Alcoholics Anonymous that, like many, he continued to ignore the obvious solution. We figure out some other way, not necessarily an easy way, but we're going to find some other way other than the one that's been in the mirror all the time. The guy keeps saying right back, you look, you just stop drinking this stuff. But anyway, in 2005, Sarah Marlin recalled how her family stood by her brother Bill as he struggled to overcome his addiction to alcohol. We couldn't sanction, you know, the alcohol, but we never, you know, showed anything, just support. It was just addressed. Your father has a problem, and we're going to work on it, and we're going to try and fix it, and, and uh, when it's fixed, you'll know. Of the Marlins' four children, Bill's struggle with alcoholism seemed to take the greatest toll upon the eldest, Alan. He was fairly upset about it. I think that because he was older and yet still a child, he got an impression that, that this was the way life was going to be. Marland later shared how regret over past mistakes and the impact of his alcohol abuse upon his family increased his dependency on liquor. It's my idea that we tear ourselves up, trying to go back, or if I hadn't done this, or if I hadn't done that, or if I hadn't have said this, etc., etc. Until finally we decide that there's only one way to solve this problem. And that is walk into the nearest saloon or have some ice and soda and the fixings stand up quickly. 
As a last resort, Bill Marlin sought treatment in the detox ward at the South Elgin Mental Hospital. They gave him one shot that he said was so hot he thought he was going to burn up. And that's all they did. He said, I don't know what that shot was, but he said it worked. Before long, the former chief executive became a devout member of Alcoholics Anonymous and re-entered the workforce. He tried jobs involving travel and practicing law. Then in 1962, displeased with his performance, Marlin shifted to an entirely different route. He got behind the wheel of a Chicago cab. He figured that was as far removed from anything he'd ever done before, and that's what he needed. And he also knew that it would give him time to reflect, time to think about the future, time to get his act together, so to speak. He said it gave him a, a, a semblance of order and structure, and uh, he really, he said he really enjoyed driving a taxi cab. Bill Marlin took pleasure in recounting how a passenger from West Virginia responded when he recognized the cabbie's name. He said, that's a coincidence. He said, William C. Marlin. He said, that's, that's, that's the name of the best damn governor West Virginia ever had. During each work week, Marlin ate and slept at a YMCA. The cabbie enjoyed his days off with his family in Barrington, a Chicago suburb. Things just seemed to all fit into place. Everybody was, was extremely happy again. The tension was gone. He had a plan and he made it work for him. And I, I think that's something to be very proud of. We're all human, we're all gonna make mistakes. But as long as we're trying, and as long as we sincerely believe that what we're doing is right, we're going to strengthen our results and we're gonna tear that crummy personality down and compose one that we can live with without being on a constant dry drum. James DeBolt recalled in 2005 Bill Marland and his family attending Barrington United Methodist Church. He was accepted and um, respected in the community the same as anybody else. This man was uh, one of us. Whether taxiing businessmen from meetings or affluent North Side women to social gatherings, Bill Marlin continued to enjoy his work as a Chicago cabbie. I can remember, uh, you know, going to all kinds of places, places that even as young as I knew were kind of interesting places. You know, he didn't have any problem picking up anybody anywhere. And we'd take him and we'd talk and have a great time on the ride. And it, was, it was a lot of fun. Then, the story goes, a businessman being transferred to West Virginia confided to a reporter at a Chicago bar how a cabbie had attempted to comfort him. And he says, yeah, and, and, and I had a bad day, and I get in the cab, and this goofy taxi driver, he says, oh, you're like West Virginia. I used to be governor there. He says, gee whiz. Well, this reporter, he says, well, stranger things have happened, you know. He, he, the reporter's inquisitive mind. And he said, did you happen to catch the guy's name? One day, I was on the city desk here at the Gazette, and we got a phone call from the Chicago Sun Times, I think it was, and said, believe it or not, we think your governor is up here driving a cab in Chicago. Upon confirming the story, the Times called back with details, collect. Another reporter covered the Charleston Gazette city desk at the time. And the guy said, we don't take collect calls, that costs a lot of money. <laughs> so he refused the call. <laughs> And, and by the following day, it was all over the news wires, but we missed the scoop. March 11, 1965, Flash Cab Company radioed Marlin to return to headquarters. Before long, the former governor found himself in the middle of an impromptu press conference. And they asked him, you know, what in the world are you doing driving a taxi cab? It seemed to me that I, I needed a, a vehicle to help me uh, compose my character, which is rather falling apart. What is and your character, Governor? He got drunk. As racial strife divided the nation, a reporter asked Marlin to advise governors dealing with integration. The former chief executive responded with wry wit. You don't want to take a taxi driver off the streets of Chicago to advise
as other southern governors do, you young man. His bitterest critics said, you know, this guy is a real man. I mean, to, to do what he has done and to come out and face the public. It took an awful lot of personal courage and determination, but he had that. He had it while he was governor. He can't go back. It's a progressive forward kind of program. We go today, and today leads into tomorrow, and tomorrow into another one. But the only one we can be concerned with is today. At a time when the former chief executive contemplated a return to administrative work, Marlin began receiving job offers from around the nation. One came from his hometown, Johnston City, Illinois. Bill Marlin's most welcome offer came from the namesake of James F. Edwards Enterprises in West Virginia's northern panhandle. Marlin, as governor, had appointed Jim Edwards chairman of the state's racing commission. When he found out about the governor, his governor, he says, look, I've got a job for you. And, um, gee, I think it was for like $25,000 a year, which in 1965 was a lot of money. I mean, that's a very large income. That really uh, made a difference to him, that there was someone that, uh, that really uh, cared about him. As he had taken to farming on Dutch Ridge years earlier, Bill Marlin thoroughly enjoyed his new role as associate director of Waterford Racetrack. There was a big red tractor, and he drove it between the races to smooth the track. And I thought he had the best job in the whole place. That was really, for him, uh, the, last, uh, the last thing that was needed on the road to recovery. Uh, we all thought it was uh, the answer. We were, uh, it was going to be uh, just like it had been. It was going to be much better than this. Two weeks after making national news, Bill Marlin, on network television, celebrated his 47th birthday. In May, the West Virginia University alumnus spoke at his alma mater, and in June, attended the Democrats' Jefferson Jackson Day Dinner. The former governor penned his story for the Associated Press, earning a vacation for his family in Arkansas. Illness struck without warning during the trip, and in August, Marlin discovered he suffered from pancreatic cancer. I was very optimistic that he was going to be fine because he was always fine. He was going to be fine. We'll fix this. Amid such optimism, Bill Marlin, in the autumn of 1965, gave his daughter Susan in marriage. The whole family sort of felt the same way that me and my mother always felt. If you worked hard enough and you were doing the right thing, then it would be difficult to fail. And so I don't think any of us, until very close to the end, really thought very seriously that he wouldn't be it. In November 1965, a day after sharing Thanksgiving with his family, William Casey Marlin died at the age of 47. The 24th governor of West Virginia, William Casey Marlin, received final rights in Barrington, Illinois. Marlin was a native of Illinois, but asked that he be cremated. When he died, it was his desire to be cremated and that his ashes be spread on the Dutch Ridge farm that he had owned during his lifetime. It was just like the perfect ending because he just loved that place so much and flying. Edsel France, the pilot who helped the governor learn to fly, participated in the ceremony. Governor Smith at the time uh, allowed him to use his private plane to uh, scatter the ashes of Marlin over the Dutch Ridge farm with so his old pilot flying. I rode in the airplane in the back seat behind Edsel with a camera and Edsel opened the window and reached a little box out and and sprinkled out the ashes and I snapped the picture and we printed it in the Gazette and that was the last of Bill Marlin. To thousands of West Virginians and to persons elsewhere, William Casey Marlin served not as an example of political success, but as an example of personal success. This orchard stands in tribute. To me, he was a true West Virginian. Although he wasn't born in West Virginia, 
it was his state. Bill Varland was unfortunate in many ways. Uh, he was a bright young man, and when he was elected governor, why, he was punished to begin with by the legislature. He was right about everything. He, he was right about school integration. He, he was right about taxing the coal wealth. And eventually, society progressed. I think he exposed the state to uh, a lot of its ills. And although he didn't necessarily have all the answers and the people at the time weren't ready for the answers, I think he did provide a vision for the state. Virtually every one of his programs has since become law. Thinking that contrives to hide behind reorganization plans rather than face basic problems of finance is to be deplored. I reiterate that I do not attempt in any way to suggest policy but I cannot leave four years of grappling with these problems without stating my own views concerning them. Valerie Marlin, recalls her daughter Susan, believed her husband highly motivated to make the most of his time and opportunities. She felt that maybe somewhere in, in the back of his mind, he didn't feel he was going to have a long time to get these things done. That it, he was needed to work quickly because he wouldn't have 80 years. Well, did everybody have a good time today? <laughs> the Marlin family, many times over, has endured tragedy. Bill's grandfather, great-grandfather, and great-great-grandfather died in mining accidents. His mother succumbed to cancer at the age of 36. Multiple sclerosis claimed the life of Bill's brother, Bob. Valerie Marlin died of injuries incurred during an apartment fire. Yet the legacy of William Casey Marland and his family is not restrained by death. One thing he wouldn't have wanted us to do uh, was to, uh, to just slow down and stop because of it. We don't dwell over what happened in the past as much as we figure out what, we're gonna, what, what better things are going to be happening in the future. And that's the way that he lived his life and I think he instilled it in all, all of us. And I said to him, <laughs> Good things will happen and bad things will happen. And it is possible that you will not get the result that you want. But the only thing that is not acceptable is for you to quit. Now tell me more. There's an old Sanskrit thing which goes something like this. Live ye therefore for this day. Yesterday is only a vision. Tomorrow is only a dream. But today, well lived, makes every yesterday a vision of hope and every tomorrow a dream of happiness. From West Virginia Public Broadcasting.